Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. And I'm really delighted to be able to tell you about our study. I want to acknowledge my co-investigators and funding that we had from the National Cancer Institute and also from Creighton University internal funding. I have no relationships to disclose. Now, according to National Cancer Institute stats, over 40% of the population will have in the US will have cancer during their lifetimes. Further, as you know, cancer has a major impact on quality of life, and the costs of care and treatment are really astronomical. Again, according to NCI, it's estimated that about $125 billion was spent on cancer care and treatment in 2010, and it's estimated that by the year 2020, those costs are going to go up to about $156 billion. I can't even imagine that amount of money. But what's even more important, many populations don't have access to that quality of care, or if they do, there's no way they can afford it. So prevention is really a priority. At the same time, Low vitamin D status is really widespread and is kind of a silent problem in the background. So numerous observational studies have shown that if you have higher vitamin D status, there's a lower cancer risk. Furthermore, basic science research has worked out many mechanisms that are plausible uh, underlying reasons for vitamin D have an effect on either preventing cancer or decreasing its progression. However, the thing that's been lacking is randomized clinical trials with cancer as a primary outcome. Because with a, many of our uh, health policy uh, makers, the thing that is convincing and necessary are randomized controlled trials. So I just want to review a little bit with you about how uh, we make vitamin D and how we get it. The major source of vitamin D for humans is from the sun. And uh, we have a precursor in all of our skin that's called 7-dehydrocholesterol vitamin D. And when we're exposed to sunlight, or the skin converts that precursor to vitamin D that circulated in the bloodstream. So that's the way nature intended us to get most of our vitamin D. There is some vitamin D available from food, for example, um, uh, salmon is a prime example, but not very much. And of course, you can take vitamin D supplementation. So on working through the body, once vitamin D is in the bloodstream, it goes to the liver where it undergoes hydroxylation to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. I'll refer to that a lot of times as 25D. And that's really the functional indicator of our vitamin D status. So if you go to your primary care provider and you say, I want to know what my vitamin D status is, he or she is going to measure your 25 hydroxy vitamin D to see how, how good or bad it is. So then 25 hydroxy D travels to the kidney and to almost all of our cells of the body where it's changed into the active form of vitamin D and it acts through vitamin D receptors to perform a myriad of functions with many effects. And numerous of these effects have the potential to uh, either prevent cancer or uh, stop it early. For example, some of the effects are stimulating the immune response, helping cells differentiate into actual healthy uh, functioning cells. So I'm going to report the first randomized clinical trial of vitamin D and cancer with uh, cancer as a primary outcome. And the purpose, as I'm going to read it so I get it exactly like it's on the screen, was to determine whether increasing serum 25 hydroxy D from prevailing levels while maintaining adequate calcium intake reduces incident 
total cancer risk, all types of cancer. And this study was done to validate the previous study that we reported in 2007. And in that study, we reported that we gave calcium and vitamin D supplementation and had a significant decrease in cancer incidence. So this study, that in that study, cancer was a secondary outcome, although the findings were very striking. So this was to validate those findings. We did a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, population-based uh, clinical trial. And the inclusion criteria that were that the participants be postmenopausal women who were 55 years of age and older, and they were living independently, so we didn't take anybody from nursing homes. And they were from a, a rural population from 31 counties out of the 93 counties in Nebraska. We excluded uh, a very few people, really, but our criteria for exclusion were, first of all, a history of cancer, except if the individuals had had squamous cell or basal cell carcinoma of the skin, they were allowed to come into the study. We also allowed into the study anyone who had had any malignancy that was treated curatively more than 10 years prior to enrollment into the study. Then we also included, excluded people who had a history of renal calculi, kidney stones, or any chronic kidney disease and we excluded people with a history of sarcoidosis or uh, tuberculosis. And lastly, we excluded anyone who had been in the active treatment arm of our previous uh, cancer uh, and vitamin D study. So we recruited these people by mailings to that target population, and we had addresses for about 99% of the housing units in that target area. We also uh, sent letters to primary care providers and to directors of public health departments so that they could support the study if they ran into people who wanted some advice about whether they should participate. And uh, we also ran ads in newspapers and on radio stations and gave talks and really saturated that target area. So we wanted everybody to know that we were doing this study and we wanted them to join us if they were eligible. 2,303 participants were randomly assigned to one of two groups. The first group was assigned to take vitamin D3, a 2,000 international unit capsule once a day, along with calcium carbonate, 500 milligram tablets, three of those a day, so 1,500 milligrams of calcium. The second group was assigned to identical placebos. And participants in both groups were allowed to take their own calcium and vitamin D because we felt it'd be unethical to let them and to make them not take any because you need that we knew for bone health. So they were allowed to take up to 800 international units of vitamin D a day and 1500 milligrams of calcium a day in keeping with uh, current recommendations at that time. So this table shows the mean and standard deviation of the serum uh, of the baseline important variable. So the, the mean age was about 65. In, uh, they were of average height. They were sort of heavy. Their average weight was about 80 kilograms, and their average BMI was about 30. There was wide variation in their calcium and vitamin D intake, so we used medians and range, interquartile ranges to describe those. And total intake for calcium, which was both intake from food as well as from supplements, was about 1,300 milligrams a day in each of the groups. And the total vitamin D intake was about 800 international units a day. And there was no statistically significant difference between intake between the active and the placebo group. 2064. Uh, participants, or 90% of the cohort, completed four years of study. 
New diagnosis of invasive or in situ cancer was confirmed by pathology reports in 86 subjects. There were 34 uh, active and 52 placebo, excluding cases that were diagnosed during the first year. We excluded cases that were included during the first year because first of all, it takes a while for vitamin D levels to rise, and then once we get them up to whatever level that would be that would start affecting cancer, it would take a little while before it would start uh, decreasing cancer incidence. And also in our previous study, we saw the effects start after one year of treatment. So this table shows the mean and standard deviation of the 25D measurements at each visit by treatment group. And you can see that at the baseline visit or visit one, there was no significant difference in the level between the two treatment groups. And by visit three, which was the end of one year of treatment, we uh, found that the serum 25 was significantly higher in the treated group than it was in the placebo group. They had increased their level about by 11 nanograms per milliliter. And then for the remainder of the study, each of the groups stayed pretty consistent in their levels of serum 25. This shows the number of cancers by site in the placebo and the active group. And you can see that the most commonly occurring type of cancer was breast, which was not unexpected, followed by colorectal and lung, the blood cancers, uh, melanovin, uh, melano melanoma, and uh, ovarian. And uh, there were other types. And under other, there was a wide variety of types of cancer. But in each of those types, there were probably only one or two individuals who developed that type of cancer. So this shows the results with a Kaplan-Meier curve. That is, it shows those free of cancer for the two treatment groups, excluding those 23 cases diagnosed during the first year. And it shows it during the course of the study. At the top is the blue line, which represents the treated group. Those that got the active vitamin D and calcium, and how many of those survived without developing cancer during the course of the study. The red line or the bottom line represents the placebo group. And so what we're seeing, there was about a 35% lower incidence of cancer in the group that cal got calcium and vitamin D compared to the group that received placebo. And this was statistically significant. So then we did a, another analysis because really what is driving the cancer effect is the blood level of serum 25. And we have the good fortune to be able to measure that. So uh, I wanted to remind you of our purpose was to see but if we raise those 25 levels, would we be able to decrease uh, the incidence of cancer, and we were able to significantly raise the level of 25D. Uh, and we know that serum vitamin D takes into account more than just the supplement pill. You're getting vitamin D, as I pointed out, from the sun. You get it some from your food. And we were allowing these women to take outside supplements. So serum vitamin D takes all that into account. So in our proportional hazards modeling in our sensitivity analysis, we found that the mean serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D that was measured at year one after we had gotten the treatment group up was a significant predictor of cancer risk. And the, as you can see, the significance level was much higher, and so it really showed a strong effect. So this is a plot taken from three cohorts, um, and we combined their serum vitamin D levels and looked at their cancer outcomes. And two of the cohorts were the ones I talk about that we did at Creighton University, this current one in our previous study where the populations were very similar. And the other one is a grassroots cohort that's a very large study that's following, I don't know, thousands of people, literally, uh, who are reporting cancers and are having their serum 25 measured. And what we can see is this analysis shows different levels of serum 25D and the risk. So the top line represents people who have 
the highest level we measured uh, as a cutoff value, uh, 50 nanograms per milliliter or more, and the lowest is uh, 30 nanograms per mil uh, or less. And there was a 70% lower risk in the persons who were 50 or above compared to those who were 30 below. We're talking some very large numbers here that can show the potential impact that vitamin D can have in preventing cancer. In this case, we're, in our case, we're looking at older people. The grassroots has younger individuals, although in this analysis, this included older people too. So we concluded that using our pre-specified treatment intervention, we saw the effect that we hypothesized. The incidence of all types of cancer reduced, was reduced by 35% in this cohort. Analyzing the data using the serum level, which as I emphasized is a more direct measurement of, of the intervention, uh, the model significance was even stronger, a p-value of 0.02, which is a much stronger value than we got with that first just group by group analysis. And this was the case with our previous study as well. When we measured the, uh, tested it using the serum 25D as uh, into the model, we had a much higher significance level, which just makes sense. So this finding really provides a great impetus for emphasizing and changing public policy so that there were, we're putting more emphasis on the importance of vitamin D status and then getting on the wagon to do something about the majority of our population who has levels that are lower even than current recommended recommend levels, which may be too low. So I want to acknowledge many organizations and people without whom this study would never have been done, and I want to thank you all for coming.